Hi, this is Misha, and for any of you who watch the channel and kind of follow what we've done over the years, this review should not be a surprise. And I know I'm not at all the first to do it, but there are not very many independent reviews. Most of them you see on this gun are basically PR from SHOT shows and things. This is my rifle, at least for a while. I don't know why I bought it. I told the distributor, I said, I'm going to regret this, and it's the dumbest decision I ever made. But my curiosity about this critter has just been too damn high. I had to get one, strip it apart, and answer some questions for myself. This is Colt's AR-15 M16A1. This is their reissue, replica, clone, retro, whatever you'd like to call it of a Vietnam version gun. Based on the basic features, I would say it's a late 60s type gun. But we'll get into some details. We're going to compare it to some other rifles, including an original M16A1, an SP1, and a few of the other replicas on the market today. Because, the, you know, one time, if you just go back a few years, there were very few to none on the market. Today, we actually have a, a great option. We have this, of course. We have the various offerings from Brownells, and we have, of course, more and more offerings from Troy. And, of course, there's always the Nodak builds you can do yourself. Well, where to begin? Alrighty. Now, for information, history on the M16A1, how, how the XM16 turned into the XN16E1, we've got plenty of history videos. This is going to be focusing specifically on this gun. Ditto for the SP1. We did a video a while back looking specifically at it. What do we have here? We have a 20 inch lightweight or pencil profile barrel. We have an A1 birdcage flash hider. We have a typical front sight base. A1 style handguards. A1 upper receiver with A1 sights. A1 lower receiver with the thinner pivot pin points and slimmer back compared to say an A2. It is a full fence. We do have an A1 port door. We have a teardrop forward assist. And we have what many call an E1 buttstock, solid in the back with the ribbing. This is rubber, and we have a rubber coated sling swivel. This was actually used quite a bit on the A1 as well. We'll talk about that a bit. And we'll get into some of the internals. So, aside from this basic rifle here, what does approximately 2500 get you? Well, you get the Colt name, of course. It comes in a cardboard box. Now, this is the older style that Colt used to use. For several years now, the newer styles have been much cheaper. At least the older style is a little heavier gauge cardboard. We have a thick plastic bag it comes in, and we have this interestingly shaped sleeve. So they are using the nicer china, I guess you could say, but it's still a cardboard box. It comes with the mag you see in it here, which is a 20 round modern Colt mag with polymer follower. We have an accessory pack. Now, your typical Colts don't have a resealable pack. They're just to rip them open. We have a GI style two-point sling. We have, of course, a manual. Also a resealable bag. Interestingly, I don't see a lock in here. And they also send you a second flash rider. It comes, at least mine came with the A1. This has the earlier three prong on it. This would have been used on the XM16E1. So 
So that's kind of neat, although I don't think it's quite worth the price still, but at least they do give you, I guess if, I guess they couldn't decide which one to put. They probably were getting feedback from multiple people, half saying use one, half saying use the other, and they decided it wasn't worth the headache. The mag too, by the way, came in a sealed, a uh, resealable bag or I wouldn't have opened it. And that is all you get. I guess it's more than some, but less than others. The original Vietnam M16A1. In 1964, the Colt Model 603 first came out. That was the first to have this forward assist. The Colt would keep the slab side upper in production as the 604. The Air Force would be the primary buyer in the U.S. for the 604. The Army, Marines, and others would go for the 603. This would turn into the XM-16E1, which was starting to see pretty heavy combat use in Vietnam by 65. The E1 was an early forerunner. It used this buttstock. It used the three-prong flash hider. Early ones could have chrome-plated bolt groups to some extent, although the, as time went on, they would go to more and more parkerizing. The earlier guns would just have a non-chromed bore and chamber with a 1 in 12 twist rate. They would introduce chrome-lined chambers around 1967, 1968. They would also do away with a three-prong flash hider around 66, 67. So late XM16E1s could have the birdcage. The chrome-lined bore, though, would not come along until actually much later. It wasn't until 7071 that chrome, full chrome line bores were coming into standard production. There's a lot of other little changes we'll kind of look at in the comparison section. The gun evolved over time, and that's kind of why I say this is a late 60s gun, because we have the so-called E1 style stock, but then we have the A1 style birdcage. We have the front sight base, I'm going to point this at you, where the flashing has been machined off. That's pretty neat. They stopped machining the flashing around 70. On the other hand, it has the lower sling swivel riveted in, not roll pinned, and they didn't start riveting until 68 or 69, so that kind of, you know, blocks us in if we want to be technical. This also has the drain hole here under the front sight base and in the stock screw. And they did not add these until 67, 68. Also, of course, we have a fully chrome, excuse me, fully parkerized bolt group, which, to be fair, was coming into service as early as 66. They did do some effort to have replica U.S. property markings. It says A1, so that's obviously what they're going for. Back here, they do have safe semi-auto. This is the first time I can ever recall Colt putting a fake auto marking on their guns. And so we see what they're going for here. Well, why don't we move along and start comparing this guy to some others I've got. So first off, I have my M16A1 here. This is an original GI surplus upper. It was refurbished by the military in the 80s. That's why it's black. Original barrel and all that. I just dropped it on a lower. The one this actually was on, I donated to my T91. I have another Nodak coming from Brownells. This is actually a limb lower, a project lower. It's The other side's got some damage to it. So, put in the comments. There was something that was going on there. Maybe a thing for story time, but it's irrelevant for today. It is an A1 style lower. And so, because I like you guys so much, I took the time to drop it on so we could have a discussion. First off, let's talk about the stock. That's an easy difference. This is the so-called A1 stock. It has the trap door. It's metal. It has a fixed sling swivel, also metal. It's no longer rubber coated. These came into use around 1970. 
71 in that era, right around the same time the chrome-lined bore came in. You see our Ford Assist here, teardrop. This has a forge code here on the upper. I noticed that the Colt replica does not seem to have a forge code here. Now, I was talking with Chris a few weeks ago about these, and the one he looked at, he said it had a forge code, meaning it was an original upper that Colt had refurbished and repurposed. I don't know what the story is with the uppers completely. I know it looks correct, everything's here, so it probably is, but something to point out. But something that is a little kind of irksome, this has the original stampings on the bottom of the barrel. The Colt barrel is pretty well unmarked, which is quite unfortunate. To put all that effort into marking the receiver and to not properly mark the barrel does kind of bother me, honestly, because the barrel is the second thing you usually look at on a Colt besides the uh, receiver. And even their standard guns have the CMP or the cage code or something on them, you know, Colt markings. This one's the later style, uncut front sight base. You see the flashing is still there. That's what I was talking about earlier. This has the later style seat belt style sling. It's still patterned after the M1 Grand M14 sling, but it's made out of nylon. This was used in Vietnam because it was less prone to getting funky in the jungle. Goes to show you that the two-point kind of modern sling is pretty anachronistic on this gun. Obviously, it'll fit, and obviously later M16A1s probably had them, but really they should have put this pattern of sling because good replicas are still being made today, and originals are still available. Another difference, I don't really want to pull everything out and show you on camera, but this has a modern rifle buffer in it. The bumper in the back is clear. This has the original so-called red wine, port wine buffer. It's just that the little bumper in the back is a, is a reddish color. So that tells me that the replica here has a reproduction modern buffer and spring in it. I'm unsure if the furniture on this guy is original. If it is, it's in really good shape. A couple of years ago, I would have said definitely, but nowadays people are making very good reproductions, but it still does feel original. So I wouldn't uh, be surprised if Colt was able to get their hands on a few sets, especially for what they're charging for these. It is interesting, there's a little bit of a, there's mold lines on the stock, which is correct, this has it too, but they're very sharp. There's also more of a mold line on the pistol grip with a little burr here from where it was poured compared to most. Could just be that it was a completely unused grip. So I'm not sure if it's really just um, an unused grip or a modern one just because of this little mold, but it's um, hard to say. It doesn't really matter. I guess if it's made close enough that you really can't tell it, it really doesn't matter. Although I still like the been there, done that feeling of original parts personally. Internally, the bolt groups are the same. They're both uh, kind of more modern, parkerized, fully parkerized carriers. Colt started adding the C to the carrier in 68 when other companies such as H&R and Hydromatic began making the M16. So that's why the C became added. I'm trying to think internally, there's really no other differences I can show you here. And then, like I said, this is an original service upper on a semi-lower. This would be a late A1. Something like this with this style of stock would have only been in very late Vietnam or post-Vietnam. But keep in mind, the M16A1 was standard in the U.S. military all the way through. Really, some units still had them in the first Gulf War. So, Colt did not officially discontinue production until 82. Next up is my SP1. Definitely worth comparing to because the SP-1 till this point was the closest an analog to an M16A1 that Colt had. 
Now this one was made in 65, so it has a lot of early E1 features. So some of them aren't really relevant, such as it does have the three-prong flash hider from the factory, non-chromed bore chamber. This has the earlier style sling. Kind of the earlier style upper, for upper forging. See, it doesn't have a forge coat here either, so that kind of tells me this one is probably an earlier upper if it's an original. Probably is. This one has the original style of receiver extension, buffer tube, where it's actually roll pinned into the receiver. Also, it has holes to take it off with the wrench instead of flats. I did check this one does have the later style with the flats. This one does have the E1 buttstock. No drain hole in the screw. Things like that. You get the idea. What's worth comparing are the internals this time. Let's take this Colt apart. Dump our mag out. First off, let's talk about the pins themselves. This one has a typical front takedown pin, standard diameter, A1 lower. Let's see here. And it has a standard rear, of course, as all Holtz tend to have. There we go. This one, like all SP1s, has a standard rear, but the front originally was a double headed screw so 601 602 style i replaced it with a push pin type that has a detent and also this hole is much larger now colt never did an m16 a1 style so full fence but without the thicker a2 reinforcements front and back on their semi-autos. Up until they went to the A2 semi-autos types in the mid to late 80s, they still kept on using this lower. The slab side lower. Now you could find some transitional guns that did have an A2 style upper still on this lower, which is quite interesting. They also never did an A1 style semi-auto with the Ford Assist. And it's easy to tell because again, they would have the larger hole in the front. Push this other pin out. Open it up here. Now again, we've got videos on this. This one has one of the earlier style hammers that's not really cut or anything. A lot of these early SP1s had modified full auto parts to make them semi only. Notice there's no web in the back. That's not something Colt did with the SP1s originally. That little block web was a more recent advent of the late 80s and 90s. First they would just be pinned in. Later they would be physically part of the receiver. Open this guy up. No web in this one either, which is very unique for a modern Colt. We have a standard mill spec type hammer as well. It's also not cut. It has the proof on the side. This has a standard bolt group. As you would see in pretty much anything. By the way, even for slab side guns, Colt started to shipping all their guns with serrations for the Ford Assist, even like the Air Force 604, around 1966, 1967. It was just easier to use the same carrier for all guns. This one, being older, however, has an older pattern of carrier. See, it's a slab side without serrations. Has the original pattern of gas key, round. We have a chrome bolt steel still. And this uses an actual, see there, see there, actual pin, machined pin, versus the more modern style cotter pin you're aware of. They would use that for a while in the 60s before going to the modern style. 
Something else, you notice this is a full uncut M16 carrier in the back. Colt started doing this several years ago in all their guns. However, with the SP1s, they always cut the carrier. This being an early production gun, second year, they only cut it back a little bit as you see. But as time went on, it would sneak further and further back and then go, they would just zip the bottom off all together on late SP1s and a lot of the sporters from the late 80s and 90s. They would also cut the carrier here and notch the hammer to hang up there to prevent slam fires and other mean things like that. An early gun like this has the edge water buffer. They discontinued that in 66, give or take. And it has the original receiver extension, as I said. So there are lots of little things like that that really don't apply for kind of for a Vietnam gun. Because this is a little early. This would be more of an E1 style. Let's look at the markings, though, just so you can see it compared to the replica. These are the original markings on an SP1. So you can see the formatting is quite similar. There's a plus sign here. That's just something they did on earlier guns. Same thing with this dimpled safety. Notice they machined off the safety stops. This is something Colt did from the very beginning and still does to this day, except on this retro. Put my bolt back in here. Oop. Notice we have our stops intact. It's pretty unique for a semi Colt. Not something they've really ever done before. Like I said original SP1. This was the semi auto that Colt shipped from 1964 through about 1985, although they probably quit made, making them a little earlier. And they made a lot of these, about 300,000. Late ones would have a lot of A1 features, except they would never have the forward assist, and they would still have the slab side lower. Otherwise, they're pretty much A1, A1 stock, A1 barrel assembly, so on and so forth. And while we finish up, I thought we'd look at one more replica. This is the Troy XM177E2. Sorry, I don't have a A1 of them, but we've got this. We can use it for some purposes. We do have the teardrop forward assist, A1 style upper. Now this does have the A2 style port door, whereas the Colt does in fact have an A1. This is probably because it's Receiver is an original. See there. So since the Troy is built on a reproduction, it's going to have a little, little less correct detailing, like up here. Now it is correct to have this delta slip ring. This is they started introduce this on carbines very early. This has the full fence A1 lower style. Now you can tell this was once kind of an A2 forging based on some machine marks back here and up here. It's well done, but you can tell that they started off with an A2 and machined it down. Whereas the Colt over here looks to be an original A1 style lower. There's just not any leftover machining they did, they did a fantastic job, and I don't think so. In fact, that leads me to one of my last points. I kind of feel like this is a, um, a Nodak lower. I think they contracted with Nodak. I've had a lot of Nodak A1 lowers, and this just kind of has all the, the hallmarks of it. May be wrong, could be, but I don't see Colt tooling up to make a whole new type of lower just for, to make a couple of hundred guns. Of course, Brownells is using Nodak now, too. I don't have a Brownells, guys. Sorry, so I can't really compare one of those. 
but I thought I'd at least bring the Troy out because I've been happy with this Troy both as a shooter and a nice representation of an XM177. They got a lot of things right with it. They also did a property mark here. They, they did replica government markings here and they did the safe semi-auto faux selector switch over here too. So kind of a similar thing. The difference is this is a $1,200 gun and this is at least double that. Also the Troy comes with two mags, a 20 and a 30. This uh, sling, a cleaning kit, a reproduction of the original manual. The Colt comes with what you saw at the beginning of the video, one mag, a modern sling, and a pretty typical manual. So the Troy comes with a little bit more. So what about the rifle itself? Obviously the original parts have been refinished. The bolt's got a little, little grit to it from the process, but I'm sure if it were used it would clean up. Trigger's heavy, military trigger. Bolt hold open of course works. Forward assist, for what it's worth, works. There is upper to lower play, just as you'd expect on a military gun. The upper and lower aren't precisely lined up. Again, this one overhangs on the edge here, compared to here. Again, very military. You can tell that they didn't really like sit down and assemble these with a great deal of care. They kind of more assembly line put these together, which to be fair, if you're wanting a replica of an honest Vietnam gun is what you want. Those guns weren't hand built. I always hate it when you get a replica. I know that sounds weird and it's too perfect. I mean, I want it to be exact in the sense of it looking like the, the original gun, but I want the assembly to look like it was put together like it would be. I mean, it'd be like getting a Sten gun that had no visible welds. You know what I mean? Or a Mosin, if they, someone ever was crazy enough to do a reproduction of a Mosin that was just perfectly straight and smooth and everything else, it just seemed off. So that's kind of how I feel about this. In the sense that the, the manufacturing, not flaws, but you know, obvious examples of coming off an assembly line kind of add to it because it makes it feel more authentic. But this is just our first review and I thought we'd pull out some guns to look at. Why not? I mean, it does feel good. It's not a badly put together gun, and it is great to finally see a true A1 style from Colt. Now, it's worth saying, guys, that this is probably honestly not built in Connecticut. This is a licensed Colt product. This is probably built, they were using a company down in Texas to do a lot of their contract builds, but they had a falling out with them. So I don't know who put these together for Colt or if they just took the parts and ended up putting them together themselves. But I know originally they were, they were definitely a contract out. And this is nothing new. Colt has loaned their name, contracted out for several special builds. The, um, the 1918 pattern BARs that they contracted with Ohio Ordnance to build. They were very nice guns. But though, you know, obviously they just had the Colt name on them. Also, the Colt 1903 pistols weren't built by Colt up in Connecticut. And a lot of their match target type guns were actually built by the same company down in Texas. So, yeah, Colt. I, again, I don't know. I'm sure initially the parts came from Colt, but the assembly and all that was done elsewhere. That's all I can kind of really think of for right now. Hope that was thorough enough for an introductory review. We'll work with this gun some more or really tear it apart more and uh, not not necessarily in a bad way just like take it apart i mean <laughs> and um kind of shoot it some see how it performs what i like about it the markings are great the authentic a1 lower authentic upper authentic style furniture it's nice that they give you both flash hiders i think it's really nice that they give you the correct front sight base that has the smooth front and back with a1 post that's all, you know, configuration-wise, it looks good. Straight slippering. I would say I wish they had found some original buffers and springs to put in here. The more original parts they put in, the better, in my opinion. 
the more it makes it a true M16. Kind of the same thing with the mag. Um, nice that they gave you a 20 round mag, but it's obviously a modern mag. It would have been nice if they could have found some metal follower period correct more or less mags. And maybe giving you two in a mag pouch, you know, a nice little kit would have been would have been neat. I mean, I know these are going to collectors, and collectors like to have full kits. Like I said, it's it's as smooth as probably a military gun was. Trigger is heavy, but not gritty. It's just a trigger. The only other complaint I have is the barrel. I really wish they had put original markings on the barrel. Because I legitimately don't know what this is. I don't know if it's fully chromed, only chrome chamber. I'm sure it is full chromed. Is it 1 in 12? Is it 1 in 7 twist? I don't know. They didn't mark it. And that would have just, I mean, to put all this effort into the lower markings, even the fake auto, and to not mark the barrel correctly is a little irksome, especially for what you pay. And that's really the final point, and that will always be the final point with these guns, is the price is just out of orbit. I mean, when you have Troy and Brownells charging, you know, twelve to thirteen hundred for their replicas, that tells you about what these cost to build, even sometimes having to make parts from scratch and make a profit. So Colt putting these at twenty five hundred is I, I don't know. Yeah, well it's Colt, but yeah, and who knows how many they'll make. Sp quote unquote limited editions and all that always end up being a lot bigger production run than people expect. But as I said, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. I'm a sucker and I just had to take one of these apart and get to play with it. My curiosity just wouldn't, wouldn't abate until I did. So I'm going to mess with it. I'm going to shoot it. I, um, I see no reason not to. This is a modern production gun. True, it is a you know reissue, reproduction of an older gun, but you're not going to devalue a gun like this by putting a few rounds through it and taking good care of it. Obviously, beating it up would, but most people really will pay about the same for a lightly used couple hundred rounds gun as they will a brand new. Especially in years to come, you know, ten years from now, who really cares? Look at look at say Chinese AKs. Yeah, a, a Polytech Legend, new in box, never fired, brings a little more, but if you say I've got a Polytech Legend in box, excellent condition, only 200 rounds fired, it's not. It's, it's still going to go for really good money. So, best case, that's what will happen with these, but who knows. Again, collector's guns are really hard to predict. Frankly, often they don't end up going for a lot of money, though, because everyone who buys them babies them, so there's as many excellent conditions out there as were originally made. Well, we appreciate you tuning in, and if you'd like to learn more about the history of the SB-1 or the development of the M16, please check out our playlist. And if you'd still like to know more, please check out Chris Bartacci over at uh, Full30. Uh, he and I talk AKs and ARs quite frequently, and I've learned a lot, and we bounced a lot of ideas off each other, including on this gun. So. Yeah, we really appreciate you tuning in. If you like, please click like. And if you'd like to help support us, and after this gun here, I definitely would need some support, please click on the link and check out our Patreon page. This is Misha. And we'll catch you next time.